Namrakachenu, 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 Hello and welcome to this edition of her Namra Kachenu, where the focus is on tax, customs and excise matter. I am Elise Dentlinger and I am honoured to be in your company for the next half an hour or so. In recent developments, Namra celebrates International Customs Day in Wolfish Bay. Honourable Ipumbu Shimi recognises the generosity of taxpayers. All this coming in a moment. On the 26th of January 2024, NAMRA enthusiastically joined the World Customs Organization in commemorating International Customs Day, themed Customs Engaging Traditional and New Partners with Purpose. The vibrant celebration unfolded in the scenic setting of the Wolfish Bay town. Namibia Revenue Agency, which since its launch three years ago has become synonymous with improved customs administration around the world. As the town of Valfast Bay, we pledge our unwavering support to your quest for improved, efficient and effective service for many years to come. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us in celebrating international customs. Day, please do feel welcome and enjoy the occasion. Thank you. Namibia is a member of the World Customs Organization, an international organization responsible for the implementation of WTO Free Trade Agreement, responsible for customs operation and administration. World Customs Organization is the global center of expertise within the customs space. Now Namibia is the member. Before that, this institution used to be called World Customs uh, Council Corporation, Council, Council Corporation before it became WCO. Now, on the 26th of January 1953, that's 71 years ago, this institution that we call World Custom Organization, which we are a very proud member, then have their first session held in Brazil. Brazil. On Tuesday, the 23rd of January 2024, Honorable Ipumbu Shimi, Minister of Finance and Public Enterprises, visited the Havana High School in Katatura. The mission was to appreciate the infrastructure enabled by taxpayers, acknowledging their pivotal role in shaping the nation's development. Here is that visit. <laughs> At the start of this visit, you spoke about how much you have heard about this school. Now that you've taken the tour around the school, have your expectations been met? Certainly, certainly. We, I, I can see that um, public resources have been used effectively here. Um, the school infrastructure is standing and is strong, and I, I believe it will last for a long time. So I'm, I'm happy that um, 
you know, um, government has realized its objective, its goal was to build a proper school so that we can save the community around here. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to see that, um, um, you know, they, that goal has been realized. Talk yeah. to us about your impressions around the execution of this project. I, I believe this project was um, executed in, within a very short space of time um, because we unfortunately we don't have the luxury of time to roll out school infrastructure because the Namibian population is growing and, and therefore we will have to increase the number of public, of public schools um, and, and, and therefore we have to do it at a fast, fast speed and um, I believe this school, the construction of this school started in 2021 and by 2022 it was almost completed. So I think it serves as a good example to others um, that it, we can actually build school infrastructure or schools in a faster, in a faster way. When you spoke to the lenders, you yeah. spoke about whose money it is. Yeah. You said it's taxpayers' money. Yeah. Accountability with regards to how that taxpayers' money is used. Do you think this is a good testimony? Certainly, certainly. So that means when we, we collect taxpayers' money, that taxpayers' money must help to build public infrastructure, must help to support development in Namibia. And this is an example of how we are helping to support development in Namibia. So if we can build schools, it means we are going to, to um, develop a Namibian child. If we develop a Namibian child, it means we are going to have Namibians who are educated who will be able to develop this country. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with, um, with what I see. The level of infrastructure used yeah. and how yeah. the school has been equipped yeah. doesn't seem to be an average. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you say about those who are involved in determining at what level the infrastructure must be set? Well, I think, I think the planning of the school, um, in, in my view, has been very effective because you, you can see uh, there was a holistic uh, way of planning. So we not, we, they were not only looking at, at buildings, but they were also thinking about the library, they were also thinking about the computer lab, they were thinking about sports, uh, sports infrastructure. We, we saw um, a field which, of course, still needs more development, but uh, the basics are there. Um, so it, it, was, it was a holistic a way of planning and, and, I, and I think that's again a, a lesson that we should all learn that we are when we are planning to build a school we must think about the needs of Elena and at, at, at this school we can see that the people who were planning were thinking about the needs of the learners. With the benefit of this tour now yeah. uh, going forward do we yeah. see similar projects being undertaken? Yeah so if government is um, through the Minister of Education is um, carrying out what is called uh, what is called a education reform program. Now, part of, um, of, of that education program, they, they have uh, many goals, I think uh, about 10 goals. Um, and, and, and one of those goals is, is to scale up school infrastructure so that in the future we do not have children who are being taught um, under tens or poor infrastructure. Um, so we will continue again in, 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 in this current year, we have provided money to the Minister of Education. They are busy uh, building classes. Uh, I, I believe they will, they will build in the region of about 1,500 classes this year. And that program will continue probably for the next five years or so. So that we, we make sure that no Namibian child is taught under poor infrastructure. One recurrent question that yeah. is always posed to us is number is yeah. what goes to the money that, uh, how is that utilized, the money that you collect? Please help us answer that. This is a good example of how the money that, or the taxpayers' money that NAMRA is collecting is put to good use because NAMRA is there to help with development. If the state does not have resources, and those resources can only come from Namibians who earn an income, whether you are an employee, whether you're an employer, whether you're a company, you have to contribute to development. Now, how do you contribute to, to development? By paying your taxes. So when, when you pay your taxes, we will be, government will be able to build infrastructure like this. Now, government will be able to look after the Namibian child and Namib government will be able to, to build future leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I want to encourage everybody with a must work with, um, with NAMRA. Because when you work with NAMRA, you are helping the Namibian child and you are contributing to the well-being of Namibia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. When we return, we will be joined by Victoria Vayulu, the senior manager responsible for trade facilitation in the Department of Customs and Excise of the Namibia Revenue Agency, NAMRA. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. We are now joined by Victoria Veyulu, the Senior Manager responsible for trade facilitation in the Department of Customs and Excise of the Namibia Revenue Agency, NAMRA. Good day, Victoria, and a very, very warm welcome to NAMRA Kachenu. Thank you very much, Elise. I'm very happy to be here. Victoria, Victoria, what is your background mm -hmm. and what motivated you to join the Namra family? Um, well, thank you first and foremost, Elise. My background essentially is I'm a legal practitioner of the High Court of Namibia, mm -hmm. but I also have a specialty in what we call international trade, business and investment law. Now, the reason I wanted to join Namra is simply because I wanted an avenue that would allow me to use the law as a tool to make an impact on the social economic development mm. of our country. And believe it or not, that, that tool or that law enables me to do so here. Yeah. So sometime in 2019, for example, I've had the pleasure of working at what we call the World Trade Organization yeah. in their division called Technical Barriers to Trade. Now, in that division, you'll find economists yeah. and lawyers there. But one of the things that I really thrived on was on the opportunity to use law mm -hmm. in order to make significant input to law policies, legal policies, yes. and so yes. forth that have an impact on the country's trade policies. So really, that is why I'm here at NAMRA. Wow, that's quite interesting. Um, tell me... Um, you have joined NAMRA now from the legal fraternity, as yes. you have just explained to us. What were your initial observations mm -hmm. and impressions upon assuming <laughs> your role in NAMRA? Thank you, Elise. Now, so, so I said, yes, I am a lawyer by profession. Mm -hmm. And one of the first impressions and observations coming here was that there is a distinct difference between studying the law yeah. and then the practical aspects of the law. Mm -hmm. So last year I had the opportunity to, vi to visit for the first time Kazungula Bridge. Now this is a bridge that connects Botswana to Zambia. Mm -hmm. It connects traders, it connects trucks, everything. Mm -hmm. and, and for me that was very special to see because the bridge served as what we call a one-stop border post in law. Mm -hmm. And these are all concepts I'm coming to learn coming into NAMRA. Okay. So the initial observations are that using the law as a tool to impact that social economic development mm -hmm. doesn't just end with the text of the law. Mm -hmm. It actually goes as far as impacting the actual infrastructure yeah. that make trade easier for not only people, but for businesses but for as well. Okay. That's very interesting. That's a significant observation as they complement not only the vision of NAMRA, but also the values that underpin this organization. Now, you just informed the viewers that you are responsible for the division trade facilitation and custom procedures, which falls under the Department of Customs and Excise. That is correct. Could you highlight the activities that your division is spearheading? All right. So, yes, you are correct to say that the Division for Trade Facilitation and Customs Procedures is one of four divisions under the Department of Customs and Excise. Mm -hmm. The other three divisions deal with border control and operational compliance. We also have the Division for Technical Services and Excise Management. And then we have the division responsible for enforcement and compliance. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to my division specifically, we have two major subdivisions. Now the first subdivisions deals with client services and customs procedures. Mm -hmm. When we talk about client services, we are dealing with mostly the registration and licensing of various custom types. So we have, for example, your clearing agents, 
your customs bonded warehouse mm -hmm. operators, yeah. we have your transit bond operators, yeah. your temporary bond operators, mm -hmm. and the likes. Yeah. So this subdivision is primarily responsible for not only setting up the procedures yeah. to facilitate those processes, but also generally for providing general support to our clientele and our stakeholders and the yeah. public at large when it comes to customs matters. matters yeah. Now the other subdivision deals with what we call customs compliance programs mm -hmm. or trade facilitation. Yes. Now, as our viewers may be aware, Namibia is a member to what we call the Trade Facilitation Agreement for the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. And lucky enough for us, that agreement is domesticated in a number of regional instruments, whether mm -hmm. it is under the Southern African Development Community or under SACU. Mm -hmm. Now, this subdivision is responsible for facilitating measures under that agreement. Yeah. And the example of these activities include what I've just mentioned earlier, your one-stop border posts, yeah. your time release studies, and of course, our recently launched authorized economic operators, which NAMRA launched last year. Yes, yes. So this is what essentially the Division for Trade Facilitation is responsible for. Now, Victoria, one of the key words that stand out from the activities that you have just highlighted include trade facilitation. Mm -hmm. What is trade facilitation? Mm -hmm. And could you enlighten our audience on the significance of facilitating trade? At mm least -hmm. that is the most important question. So trade facilitation, in fact, is one of the functions for NAMRA in terms of our establishing legislation. And simply put, trade facilitation is really the engine for economic development for any country. Mm -hmm. And I say this because trade facilitation is essentially based on three pillars. That is the pillar for harmonization, simplification, and standardization. And what do I mean by those three things? It means that our procedures must be simplified. They must be harmonized and standardized in such a way that it is easy for traders and, of course, passengers to trade from border to border. So if, for example, Namibia uses a procedure for the importation of goods, that procedure must be similar to the procedures of another country with whom Namibia trades. In that way, you are not only making trade easier, but you are also ensuring the collection of revenue, which is really also our key mandate as NAMRA. So for me, trade facilitation then means that are our procedures simplified, are they harmonized, but also are they standardized and based on what we call international best practices. If those three things are not there, then it means that we are not trading efficiently across borders. So, Victoria, thank you for pointing out the three uh, pillars of trade facilitation. Now, I have with me a recent uh, public notice issued by NAMRA mm -hmm. for the renewal of clearing agent mm -hmm. licenses for 2024. Mm -hmm. Now, based on the activities that you have just highlighted, our viewers are now aware, aware mm -hmm. that the Division Trade Facilitation in Customs Procedures mm -hmm. is responsible for the licensing of clearing agents. Could you provide us with more details of the licensing process for clearing agents and why the renewal of clearing agent licenses is important? Oh, thank you for the question, Elise. I think I want to answer that question first and foremost by explaining to our viewers that generally anyone is allowed to import and export goods into any country. Now, clearing agents, or other words, customs brokers come in when people don't know or are not familiar with customs processes and want to employ an expert who is very familiar with those processes to assist them with the import and export processes. So for us in Namibia and for NAMRA specifically, we are guided by what we call Section 73 in our Customs and Excise Act, which really outlines the legal basis for the licensing of clearing agents. And in terms of that section, Elise, we are saying that anyone who wants to import or export goods mm -hmm. on behalf of another person, so in other words, a third party, they must be licensed by our commissioner. Mm -hmm. And in terms of that same act, we are saying that the licensing period is valid from January to December each and every year. 
Now, as the year has just started, we have noticed that there are a number of clearing agents who have not renewed their licenses. And renewal is important because it helps us as the institution, the regulatory authority, to determine what is the compliance of that clearing agent. Are all their compliance requirements in order? And that is why we require clearing agents to renew. And then in the public notice, we have called for them to start renewing their licenses. For those, of course, who are, don't have licenses, they must apply for the first time. But for those who already have licenses in existence, they must renew them to enable us to assert their compliance and, of course, to sort of give them a permission to continue conducting the service on behalf of importers and exporters. Thank you so much. That was a very informative. So I, I think our viewers now have a, a better understanding mm -hmm. of what the what's and what nots. Uh, Victoria, uh, now you have talked to us about your observations mm -hmm. and functions under the Division Trade Facilitation and Customs Procedures. Mm -hmm. In your current capacity, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the challenges mm -hmm. uh, that you are currently facing, mm -hmm. addressing and navigating through? Um, well, well, Elise, I like to think of challenges really as opportunities for growth. And there are a lot of opportunities for growth within my specific division. And one of those areas, first and foremost, is to strengthen our stakeholder collaboration. Now, for us as trade facilitation, we have different kinds of stakeholders. Of course, we have the businesses, in other words, the private sector, but we also have stakeholders who are what we call other government agencies. Now, for me, the opportunity there is to strengthen how we engage what we communicate and how we collaborate with those two categories of stakeholders. And I'm saying this because on the one hand, with other government agencies, there are a number of trade facilitation initiatives that we really rely on their support to, to, to market to the private sector. And one of these activities, for example, is the recently launched Authorized Economic Operator Program. And in that program, what we do is we offer certain trade facilitation benefits, such as reduced security requirements, or even simply faster clearance processes of imports and exports of that company who is then approved as an authorized economic operator. But where we need the assistance of other government agencies is to say, at the border, what other benefits could they also give to facilitate trade? For example, if an authorized economic operator requires a permit for the import or exportation of a certain commodity or good, then it would be great for that government agency who is responsible for issuing that permit to be able to do it in a lesser time. Because what it essentially means is that as an authorized economic operator, you are compliant and there is a relationship of trust not only, not only between you as a private business but also you and customs and you and other government agencies as well. So it will only be in our interest to facilitate the trade of those goods so that goods are not stuck at the border and in that sense we really facilitate our collaboration between us. And of course, again, one of the opportunities that I have observed that really we can work on is the stakeholders in the private sector. I realize that we still have a lot of information to share with our clients or our stakeholders. And perhaps my humble request is just even platforms such as this, that we really tune in, that we really listen, and that we also engage and ask questions to help us to comply with customs regulations. So for me, really, those are the two opportunities that I see for growth within this division of mine. Thank you very much, Victoria, for that one as well. Uh, we have really benefited from your insight about the activities and okay. challenges of the division, trade facilitation and customs procedures, mm -hmm. and especially on the process of the licensing mm -hmm. of clearing agents and DTIs. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up, what final message mm -hmm. would you like to convey to our val valued clients? Mm. Thank you, Elise. Uh, really, I think that is also a very important uh, question where I am concerned. And I want to convey an important message, not just to our private sector, but I hope to our viewers who are also young Namibians, and just to inform them that, well, we all have a role to play in the economic development of Namibia. 
And that role, Elise, mm -hmm. starts with being a compliant taxpayer, a compliant trader, right? But the obligation rests not only with the revenue authority in making sure that you are compliant. As a young Namibian, as a taxpayer, as a trader, the obligation also rests with you to find out what are the compliance requirements to make sure that I remain compliant. And of course, being compliant assists us as a revenue authority to make sure that we collect revenue, really facilitate trade for the impact and the benefit of the Namibian. So this is the role that I want our viewers to see themselves playing and contributing towards in the functions that we emanate for the Namibia Revenue Agency. Victoria, thank you so much for coming in today and share such a wealth of knowledge that I believe that our listeners really, really would enjoy listening to and implement. And I really want to thank you for taking out the time coming here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elise. It was a pleasure being here. Now, that was Ms. Victoria Veyulu, the Senior Manager responsible for trade facilitation in the Department of Customs and Excise of the Namibia Revenue Agency, NAMRA. We impact the livelihood of every Namibian. Introducing Evelyn Kauraitha, a seasoned te senior tax officer serving at Namra Dedicated Service Centre in Vintuk with a wealth of expertise in taxations, bringing a wealth of knowledge and dedication to her role. Here is Evelyn Kauraitha. For the opportunity. My name is Evelyn Kaureisa Kahorongo. I was born in Windu but raised in Ketmans. It's where I have started my primary education, uh, where I've also learned the Kwekwe -kwe Kowa. I continue with my high school education in Windu uh, 16 years back, where I've joined uh, England Revenue uh, as a data typist. While I'm a data typist, I started my tertiary education with uh, uh, Polytech of Namibia. Uh, five years back, I find myself in a position as Chief Taxation Officer. Uh, I'm a self-motivated, disciplined, trustworthy person. Currently, I am with Namra Dedicated Sender, where I am acting as a Senior Tax Officer. As a Senior Tax Officer, my duties are approving of revisions, allocating of audits and approving of income tax audits. What motivates me is learning, learning new skills, experiencing new things, be able to help and assist colleagues and taxpayers. And at the end of the day, you are seeing this person living with a smile that makes you happy. Feelings of belonging and being part of a team. My future plan is to keep on improving myself, furthering my studies, keep myself equipped with the latest technology as the world in the future is digital. My message to the viewers, Namra is here for you. All what you have to do is just get in touch with us, get close to us, and we will take you through the process how to comply. Thank you. Now let's focus on the SADC Trade Facilitation Program. Good day everyone. My name is Andreas Shete from NAMRA Trade Facilitation. Today I'm going to talk about the Southern African Development Community Trade Facilitation Program. Now the Southern African Development Community is a regional economic community which comprises of 16 member states of which Namibia is one. Now the mission of SADC is to promote sustainable and equitable economic growth and social development within the region. Now to break down the SADC trade facilitation program, 
uh, in simpler terms, uh, trade facilitation refers to the simplification and harmonization of international trade procedures that enable a smooth movement of goods across the border. To ensure that this is achieved within the SADC region, SADC with the aid of the European Union has developed the Trade Facilitation Program to deepen regional economic integration. This program was developed and approved in March 2016 by the Ministerial Task Team Force on the Regional Economic Integration in alignment with the objectives of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. The TFP um, uses a five-year timeline which covers 28 trade facilitation measures that are clustered around four pillars, namely transparency, predictability, simplification, and cooperation based on the simple standardized customs procedures and practices. Now, under the trade facilitation program, there are three results that I expected from here. Result number one is to ensure that the SADAC protocols on trade and trading services is implemented with a focus on non-tariff barriers, technical barriers to trade, sanitary and phytosanitary measures. Now these initiatives include coordinated border management, uh, which allows um, coordination and collaboration among uh, border agencies. The second one is a one-stop border post. Um, this initiative allows uh, goods and uh, people to stop only once in an OSBP uh, facility. Now the third one is a time release study. Uh, this study um, measures the average time uh, it takes to clear um, a consignment at the border. Now this uh, study is so important that it identifies the bottlenecks and also um, provides um, an opportunity for border agencies um, to uh, find solutions to solve uh, these uh, problems or bottlenecks. In addition to the trade facilitation initiatives that I have spoken um, earlier, there are other trade facilitation um, tools that are recommended under this program. Now, number one is um, the cross-border recognition of um, a regional framework of uh, the authorized economic operators to enable um, mutual recognition of accredited traders across the region. The second one is the electronic uh, certificate of origin to authenticate um, the origin of the goods. The third one is the regional customs uh, transit bond uh, guarantee and uh, the fourth one being uh, customs to business cooperation framework under which the regional uh, customs to business forum and the national uh, customs to business forum are uh, for uh, The third result aims to achieve the regional aspects of the EU SADAC economic partnership agreement. Um, this is to strengthen economic relations between the EU and SADAC member states on a bilateral basis and in conformity with the provisions of the World Trade Organization. In conclusion, Namibia Revenue Agency, in collaboration with other governmental agencies, is committed to ensure that the trade facilitation uh, initiatives are implemented in Namibia to achieve the objectives of the SADAC trade facilitation program and to improve the seamless movement of goods in and out of the country. With that said, thank you. In the next insert, we will look at good standing certificate criteria until the 1st of June 2024. Hi, I am Nesla Watanawa and today we are going to talk about the transitional changes when it comes to the certificate of good standing. 
The following interim arrangement for acquiring a tax certificate of good standing is until the 1st of June 2024. Taxpayers are to make a payment of 10% of their outstanding capital amount. To get an additional certificate, proof of honouring payment arrangement is required. Taxpayers who fail to honour the payment arrangement will pay 20% of the capital amount in order to be issued with a certificate of good standing. The transitional arrangement shall be implemented with immediate effect. Kindly note that as from the 2nd of June 2024, taxpayers are expected to pay the full capital amount in order to be issued with a certificate of good standing. Here's the trivia of duties. Did you know? Who can be considered a large taxpayer in Namibia? Large taxpayers are based on the threshold of an annual turnover of 75 million or more. Regardless of the turnover, all mining companies will be classified as large taxpayers. Large taxpayers contribute more revenue in terms of domestic tax collection. Serving with passion. Up next, we are looking at World Trade Organization Trade Facilitation Agreement. Good day, everyone. My name is Nalia Poluwe from Namra Trade Facilitation. I am going to talk about the World Trade Organization Trade Facilitation Agreement. The World Trade Organization, which is called WTO, is an international organization which is dealing with the rules of trade between countries. The WTO members reached an agreement on trade facilitation agreement which is called TFI in December 2013, which have then entered into force in February 2017. The main aim of this uh, TFI agreement is to make it easier for traders from all member states to participate in international trade. Namibia has been a member of WTO since January 1995. The main objective of the WTO TFI is to improve, to improve trade efficiency, encourage economic growth, increase transparency, and to facilitate trade. The Trade Facilitation Agreement 
have three sections with 24 articles in total containing provisions to expedite movement of goods across the borders. It set out measures on trade facilitation and customs compliance issues. The first section is contained 12 articles regarding trade facilitation and customs cooperation. The first section contains uh, 12 articles which is speaking to trade facilitation measures and customs cooperation. Article 1 is publication and availability of information which is requiring all the WTO members to publish information related to import, export and transit procedures, fee regulations and so on. And then Article 2 is opportunity to comment. Uh, this one requires the WTO members to provide an opportunity for interested parties to comment in proposed laws and make consultations with stakeholders and border agencies. Article 3 speaks to advance ruling. This is to set out a requirement in terms of advance ruling, uh, specifically in classification, origin and valuation. Article 4 is procedures for appeal or review. This one requires member states to allow traders to appeal on the decision made. And then the next article is Article 5, which is speaking to other measures. These measures are specifically or to set requirements or notification for increased controls or in inspections, such as detentions. The next um, the next article is Article 6, which is speaking to fees and charges. This one requires member states to explain in writing on the fees or charges imposed on importation, exportation, and penalties. The next article is Article 7, which is speaking to clearance of goods, which requires member states to adapt and simplify standardization and harmonization of customs procedures. Article 5 is other measures. This one is speaking to member states to set requirements or notification for increased controls and inspections um, such as detentions. And then the next one is Article 6, which is speaking to fees and charges. This one requires member states to explain in the writing on all fees imposed on importation, exportation and penalties. Um, the next one is Article 7, which is speaking to clearance of goods. This one requires member states to adapt and simplify standardization and harmonization of customs clearance procedures. Article 8 of the WTO TFI is border agency cooperation. This one requires international cooperation between members' border agencies. Article 9 is um, movement of goods. This one uh, speaking to the movement of goods intended for import under customs control. Article 10 is formalities. These are formalities that has to do with importation, exportation and transit. The next article is um, Article 11, which is freedom of transit. This one requires member states to cooperate and coordinate for the goods in transit. Article 12 is customs cooperation, which encourages sharing of best practices among the member states. Those are 12 articles that are covered under section 1 and then the next section is section 2 which covers 10 articles on special treatments for developing countries and least developed countries that they can implement based on the stipulated categories. And then the third um, section, it covers two articles of the institutional arrangements and final provisions. This contains provision on the establishment of permanent committees for national trade facilitation for the WTO members. Lastly is section 3. This section has two articles on institutional arrangements and final provisions. These provisions are on establishment of permanent committees on trade facilitation for the WTO members. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. Do you want to make a payment for tax debt? Here are the available options for payment. My name is Angela Kamu, Senior Revenue Treasury Officer at NAMWA. I'm going to take you through the process of making payments to our NAMWA offices. We have four modes of payments which are acceptable at our offices, which are direct deposits, cash payments, electronic fund transfers, and speed points machines. When making electronic fund transfers, we have two accounts available for our taxpayers, which is a receiver of revenue, account 165001 and uh, the VAT dedicated account 165060. When making a direct deposit, our taxpayers need to fill this deposit at their commercial bank. You need to have your TIN 
with you. The tin consists of eight, eight characters and then you should also know the period that you are making the payment for. When making an electronic fund transfer for your penalty or interest liability due to NAMRA, you use the EFT referencing example as shown on the screen. It also has 19 characters but on the text type and text period, you put 999999, indicating that the payment is account payment. When making electronic fund transfers, EFT referencing example is shown on the screen, which comprises of 19 characters. The text pair reference number comprises of five parameters, which are as follows. One, represent the payment method, in this case, EFT payment. O6, Office of Registration or your Return Office. The 8 character represents your text identification number. 14 is text type, in this case, employee's text. 201806 is the text period for which the payment is meant for. The question for the previous episode was, when is the closing date to participate in NAMRA Talks? The answer is the 20th of February 2024. Our question for this episode is, which school did Honourable Minister of Finance and Public Enterprises Ipumbushini visit? Kindly email your answer to namrakachenu at namra.org.na. The due date for submission is the 8th of February 2024. The winner will be announced in the next episode. And with that, we conclude this edition of Namraka Chenu. We trust that the information shared has been both valuable and insightful. Join us again in two weeks for the latest updates. Until then, stay informed, stay compliant, and goodbye. Giving fairness and equality.